I'm honored to introduce our panelists and, uh, and discussant today. Uh, Dr. Adeyinka Akinchulare Smith is a licensed psychologist who is originally from Sierra Leone. She is a tenured associate professor in the Department of Psychology at the City College of New York, the City University of New York, and at the Graduate Center, CUNY. Dr. Hawthorne Smith is the clinical director for the Bellevue NYU program for survivors of torture and a clinical associate professor at the NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Catherine Porterfield is a clinical psychologist at the Bellevue NYU program for survivors of torture where she provides care to individuals and families who have survived torture and refugee trauma. Dr. Porterfield chaired the APA's task force on the psychosocial effects of war on children and families who are refugees from armed conflict residing in the United States. And our discussant, Dr. Charles Figley, is the Paul Henry Kurzweg Distinguished Chair in Disaster Mental Health and Professor and Director of the Traumatology Institute at Tulane University. He was a Fulbright Fellow and Professor at the College of Social Work at Florida State University and the past President and Founder of the Green Cross Academy of Traumatology. Dr. Figley currently serves Division 56 as a representative on the APA Council of Representatives. Thank you all so much for being here. And Dr. Smith, I will hand it off to you. Thank you so very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for attending. Um, I am honored to be um, a member of this panel. And I think that what we will be speaking to you about today hopefully will um, resonate as what is a, a very pertinent and crucial current issue um, internationally and domestically. And um, where we want to really sort of take this, I think, to map out the presentation will be that I will talk a bit about the context in which treatment takes place with uh, survivors of torture, refugee trauma, and forced um, people and forced to migrate to other countries. Um, I will look at the interdisciplinary aspect of working in this way. I will then pass it over to Dr. Akinshulore Smith, who will give a case example, um, sort of a, I think a good example of the way that we work together as a team. And then Dr. Porterfield will talk more about some of the forensic aspects of this particular work. And then um, Dr. Figley will have the unenviable task of um, tying it all together in uh, one sort of neat ball to make sense of it. So um, thank you. And I would just like to start by saying that um, the three primary panelists, we all represent the Bellevue NYU program for survivors of torture. Um, we've been around for a little more than two decades. I've served people from more than 100 countries around the world. Um, even this past year, um, we serve um, more than 700 people from 70 different countries. And uh, we really try to help to rebuild the bodies, the minds, the spirits of people who have been tortured or persecuted. And the reason I show this slide with these two particular images is that Bellevue really sort of sits at a nexus um, between what is modern and what is ancient. We, um, we were housed within the oldest um, public hospital in the United States. Bellevue's been around since 1734. But at the same time, we're at the seat of you know, real um, evidence-based practice and scientific breakthrough. But it's really that combination is sometimes holding on to what is what has been central to healing for a long time, a sense of humanism, um, really helping to um, foster that healing spirit that resides within um, the survivors with whom we work. And to go along with that, I mean, part of the way we approach things at PSOT, which is our short little acronym, is that we really take a strength-based, a resilience-based approach to working with these survivors we feel that there is a big difference um, between being a victim and being a survivor. Anybody can be a victim. Wrong place, wrong time. But to be a survivor really speaks more to an attitude, sort of a, a comportment, uh, a way of reacting toward life, um, a, a proactive sense. And we really engage trying to help the survivors to marshal the internal and community resources that are available. Um, we take a very holistic sense of the people we are working with. We understand that different stressors and different aspects of functioning do not operate in a vacuum. So we understand that in order to really be effective, we need to take on an interdisciplinary approach. This, I think, would just for a moment to sort of make a distinction between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. 
when we talk about the way we look at things, it's not like psychiatry is over here, um, medical doctors are over here, social work is in this aspect. We really try to work and combine things together again to really look at this holistic sense of the survivor. And one of the things we're dealing with is that we're dealing with multiple stressors. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, there are indeed many ways to intervene. So quickly, to look at some of the context. Oftentimes when um, time permits and we're doing this sort of uh, presentation, I will ask people in the audience to write down three to five of the most important things in the world to them, or things that make life worth living. It can be very wide ranging. I will collect the papers and then anonymously read some of the responses and you often hear things like you know, somebody's name, um, being a parent, being a sibling, being in a loving relationship, um, practicing your faith as, as you desire, um, your health. Um, it can be material um, objects or things that you've gained, your, your advanced degrees, it could be anything. And basically what I'll do in sort of a fit of overblown theatrics is take the responses and rip them to shreds and ask the respondents to imagine their life right now if they were currently unable to reclaim any of these things that had been purposely and violently ripped away from them. Now, overblown theatrics aside, that is in some ways the context in which we're dealing with our clients. We are really looking at the ongoing effects of recurrent and reinforcing trauma. It really helps us to keep in mind some of the questions we've been asking about the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. We have to question the P. Is it really post when we're dealing with someone that has been through some form of social dislocation, whether that be a rebel insurgency, a civil war, ethnic cleansing, homophobic persecution, whatever that might be. The trauma that goes along with that, the fact that many of the clients we've seen have been captured and sort of tortured in a quote unquote classical sense, but somehow escaping from that situation, perhaps living as an IDP, an internally displaced person within their home country then fleeing across the border, oftentimes to a neighboring country which is also suffering from some sort of social dislocation, poverty, and there may even be xenophobic reactions. Many times these people then have to deal with refugee camps with all their endemic public health and emotional impact. Dealing with immigration processing, coming to this country, again, a good portion of the people we are working with have been in detention centers here in the United States because they have made the crime of coming here without the proper documentation because they fled in a situation of catastrophe. And then dealing with USA. And here we always say that now they're faced with New York City and all of our infamous warmth and fuzziness. So there's a lot. Can we really talk about this in terms of post when a lot of these current stressors serve to keep the trauma alive in the present sense? And we understand that people are going to respond to this in different ways. but we are sort of at this, this meeting point where we see how the physical and the emotional scars of torture, again, these are not distinct things that work in silos. Um, I remember a gentleman who was um, incarcerated in Ivory Coast and sort of visited by two guards, almost the way we would see in a police show of the good guard, or the good cop, bad cop scenario. Well, he had the good guard, bad guard. And the bad guard would come in and physically abuse him, threaten his life, beat him, hurt him, draw blood, and say, the next time you see me is the last time you will ever see anyone because I want to kill you next time. And then this client will be left in, a, in an isolated cell, darkened cell, for an indeterminate amount of time. Then, after some time, the quote-unquote good guard would come in and say, oh, my brother, what happened? You know, let's... Here, let me give you some water. I can't believe he did that. Please just tell us what we need to know. You know, we, we don't want to hurt you anymore. Let's just make sure this is going on. we we got to fix this. And then the door would shut again, and the client would be left in the dark. This went on a number of times before he was able to escape and eventually make it to the States and to our clinic. And when we sat down together, what he explained to me was that the pain and the emotional scars, what really weighed on him most was not the physical abuse, it wasn't the physical torture, but it was that not knowing what was coming next, that lack of control, the emotional scars. Again, what is perpetrated among people physically and emotionally is really a deep intertwining of effects. So 
some of the common reactions to torture and refugee trauma, it really impacts our clients along a wide spectrum. And I could add more parameters to this, but my, my um, PowerPoint skills are limited, so I stopped at five. It can impact in the way someone thinks memory deficits and problems, physical pain, the actual loss of limbs, scarring, broken bones, as well as sometimes somatic complaints for people who don't necessarily have the emotional language or can be somatic reactions. Many of our clients who come from Tibet, for example, there is no word for depression in the Tibetan language, but they might come in and say, I have headaches, I have stomach aches, there can be physical ramifications behavioral, emotional, spiritual, but what I really need you to really look at and take home from this picture is that these things do not, again, operate in vacuums. They really come together, and where our clients live, if you can see my cursor is right in the middle here where it's darkest, that all of these things intervene, they all overlap, and that is where a lot of our interventions need to take place. So this is the bad news, that there's so many ways in which they're impacted. But the good news is that there's so many different ways to intervene and that the ways of intervention can also all lead back and so that someone, for example, who comes in on our interdisciplinary team to see the medical doctors and has some alleviation of pain, that might put them in a situation where they're willing to engage with other services or it will help them to sleep at night so when they wake up in the morning they're not feeling as groggy and they can move on so that these things we can really begin to um, push back in multiple ways. Uh, we will come back to this. But another thing, that's sort of at the personal level, but our clients are also dealing with various spheres of marginalization in terms of how they are um, comporting themselves, what they have access to within the society at large. Educational functioning, so many of our clients do not speak English as a first, second, or third language, who may have been leaders in their community, um, but now are starting over. As our clients tell us, you never know who's driving your taxi. You never know who's sweeping your floor. Might have been an ambassador before, or a medical doctor, or what have you. Social service provision. Um, there can be a lack of resources. There's often a lack of resources. But oftentimes there might even be stigma. You know, someone who has been the principal um, for not just their nuclear family, but their extended family, and now having to come and ask for quote unquote handouts. Um, we have had clients who have walked from the Bronx all the way down here to the Lower East Side of Manhattan because they have not wanted to ask for a Metro card. Um, legal advocacy as the grand majority of people we work with are asylum seekers, um, you know, have never set foot in a courtroom setting before, what have you. Um, there, there's a lot to be spoken about there. I briefly mentioned vocational and professional losses and social functioning. Um, I mean, we were out in um, Idaho, Dr. Porterfield and I, and, and you know, dealing with a, a lot of the young men, the lost boys of Sudan, who were then in their early 20s, just saying, you know, we have no way of really integrating the society here. We don't date, but back at home, we would be getting married now. We would be starting our families. So all these various levels of social functioning where they're marginalized as well. So what can we do with all that? And very briefly, I will say, focusing on issues of safety and empowerment. And if there's anything I say, I hope you will take home with you is that it does not have to be therapy to be therapeutic. If you come to our program, oftentimes the longest line you will see in our hallway has to do with our social service provision, people who can help people with their, um, with their asylum processes, getting into school, getting children hooked up into school, helping with housing, something really concrete. And again, this gets back to that center of where the person is, where maybe they will begin to think, hmm, this program has helped out, maybe I will make myself amenable to this weird thing called therapy or join a group or do something like that. Again, there are so many ways they are challenged, but there are so many ways that we can intervene. Helping someone to regain a sense of community and connection, um, alleviating the pain, the physical pain that they're going through, providing the emotional relief through therapy, through activity groups, um, spiritual engagement, helping people walk through what might be a crisis of faith for them, and the social legal support. Again, just to really flip things on their head and say that the bad news is our clients are challenged in so many ways. The good news is there's so many different ways we can intervene. 
So a uh, couple points on that. Culturally syntonic interventions, um, we need to be flexible in terms of our treatment techniques and our approaches. Not everything we learn in grad school is appropriate for the, for the clientele we're working with. We need to allow our teachers, our clients, to be our teachers and let us know what's going on. I've had the privilege of helping to co-facilitate a group for French-speaking African survivors for the last 20 years. And one of the things they talked about is that it would be very rare in many of their home countries to go seek individual therapy or to go outside of the family and see a social worker or a psychiatrist or psychologist. But within that extended family network, that's where they would go and ask advice and be sustained by others. And so the group that we were able to develop here has really grafted well in that sense of an extended family and allows clients to not only um, be helped, but also to be part of the healing mechanisms for others. Again, for them to really feel empowered in the sense that they are not just people who are needy, they are people who are needed. And this, again, really works in lockstep with our focus on resilience and the power, the intrinsic power of these uh, survivors who are moving forward in life, not pathology and what is wrong with them. We realize that these are not sick people. These are people who are dealing with sick circumstances. These are not abnormal people. These are people who are dealing with abnormal um, situations and helping them to realize that and internalize that is really part and parcel of what we do. And my last slide is just one thing that's really helped um, inform me. Again, a great lesson I learned from our clients. One of our group sessions, we had a, a gentleman from Mauritania who raised the question, how does one change the world or at least survive in the world? And I was very surprised that the group came up with consensus. And the nine people who attended came up with three things. They said la sagesse, le courage, et l'espoir, wisdom, courage, and hope. But they went further and they explained that in order to survive the world, if you have two of these three qualities, no matter which two, it's insufficient. Because if you are a courageous and hopeful person, but you lack the wisdom to put your activities, to push them forward in a way that's effective, you're doomed to failure. Conversely, if you're a wise and hopeful person, but you lack courage, then you will not act upon your convictions and you will be forever just in a prison of inertia and inactivity. But as you work with the population we meet, and I'm sure that you're meeting in your, in, in your programs, the wisdom is there. When we think about what these folks have lost and what they're overcoming, the challenges they're facing, we don't even have to speak about courage. But what they have taught us is that what is most difficult to hold on to is a sense of hope. But again, they went further and said that hope, it's not so much something you have, it's something you do. Again, it's a comportment, it's a behavior, it's an attitude towards the world. It is a capacity to hope. And perhaps most importantly, it is something that can be shared. This capacity to hope can be shared among our clientele or from us as service providers. And Writ large, I believe that that's what our work is, that's what our program does, is to help provide and put people in a context where they have the capacity to hope so that they can use the wisdom and the courage they already possess. And with that, I would really like to turn this over to my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Yinka Akinshulori Smith. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thank you again for having me. So, as I said earlier, I have had the privilege of um, working with our, working at the Bellevue NYU program for survivors of torture since uh, 1997, I believe. And during that time, we've had a whole range of clients. And just to kind of give you a sense of the clients we see, I have some examples up there. Uh, Mr. Yu, who was a 28-year-old banker from Uganda, who had been minding his own business, doing his work, until he was suddenly outed. Um, and as a result, because of his sexual orientation, was prosecuted, was persecuted, sorry, by the government, uh, imprisoned, um, rejected by family and community, and ultimately had to flee to come to the U.S. in search of safety. 
Um, another example is Miss A, um, a 35-year-old journalist from Afghanistan who had come to the U.S. for a conference, was um, seen at the conference in photos that were passed throughout the web, um, whose family had been harassed severely because of her journalistic activities, um, and began to receive death threats. During that time, her family told her, you know what, don't come back, just stay there because the harassment will continue. Um, and and I, what I didn't uh, say was that she had also had been kidnapped prior um, coming to the U.S., but was able to escape. Um, another example of the clientele that we see at PSOT, um, a 50-year-old Tibetan nun who, again, because of her activities, um, you know, struggling, fighting, speaking up for freedom of Tibet from China, was uh, jailed by Chinese authorities. And finally, another example is Mr. S, a 36-year-old man from Sierra Leone who stood up against a secret society, refused to have his daughters um, circumcised, and was harassed. So this is the kind of the range of, of communities, of people who we see. What I specifically like to speak about is Miss X, um, a 28-year-old married woman from Albania who came to us with her two children. Um, we first met Miss X in New York City um, in January of 2007. Now, just to give you a bit of a sense of what she went through before she and her family finally came to us, um, I just want to give you a little bit of background. Um, in 1996, the Democratic Party came into power in Albania. Um, Ms. X and her family, her husband and their extended family, had been very supportive of this process. Um, but during April, between April and October of 2008, a number of family members on both sides, on her side of the family and on her husband's side of the family, um, got caught up in a series of killings around um, land disputes and uh, were, were really harassed um, verbally and physically and then threatened because of their political affiliations. Um, by 2003, these threats, this harassment had escalated um, into actual acts of violence against Ms. X and her family. In March 2005, Ms. X and her husband were traveling between two towns when um, they were abducted and threatened. Um, they were held and the husband was warned that this is what happens to people who um, you know, support democracy. Uh, they threatened that she would be killed, and at the time they had a young, uh, an infant daughter. The threat was that not only would would Miss X be killed, but that the daughter would be uh, taken to parts of Europe and be sold on the black market. Um, this all culminated in June of 2005, when Miss X was again traveling from town to town on her own. <coughs> Excuse me. She was then abducted by two men who gang raped her and told her that this is what happens again to whores who support <coughs> the Democratic Party. At that point, Ms. X and her husband just recognized that it was too much. It was too um, frightful for them to remain in Albania and then they decided to flee. So they left, uh, fled through Europe went to Italy, eventually by 2005, August of 2005, the family arrived in the United States, um, again, seeking safety. So, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> Ms. X came to us um, on a referral by her attorney. At that point in time, the family decided to apply for asylum. Um, the reason why the attorney referred her to us was that every time they tried to begin to document her case and talk about what had happened and why she was seeking asylum, she couldn't hold it together. She would break down into tears, she would become overwhelmed, she would shut down. Um, the attorney sending her to us at PSOT was with the hopes that we would be able to get some information out of her. Uh, so she came in and went through our intake process. Typically, our intake process is a lengthy process that lasts from anywhere from 
two to potentially four hours um, where we have one of our psychology or our social work interns or externs um, conduct the intake assessment and then the case is reviewed by um, a supervising clinician who is licensed and then presented to our treatment team. During Miss X's intake, she um, was really looking for assistance and, and she actually said that she was looking for help. In fact, one of her statements was, every day my daughter says, why are you crying mommy? I want to feel joy. Um, she was very depressed, spoke of intrusive memories, um, difficulties, just functioning with everyday life um, and really was in search of help. When the when the intake was conducted, it became clear that she was highly symptomatic. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense also of who was in her family at the time, as I mentioned, Miss X fled with her husband. Um, they came with their young daughter, and during the time she had arrived and come to see us, they had had um, a new a four-month-old. So very young family, living on their own in isolation in Brooklyn and just barely getting by. So in, in considering how to begin to address and approach treatment with someone like Ms. X or with any of our patients who comes to us through um, the Bellevue program, the first question we want to kind of begin to look at is who is this person? Um, are they a refugee? Are they an asylee? Are they an asylum seekers? Because this all has consequences and implications for what will happen for them legally. We also want to get a sense of why are they coming to see us now? What are the expectations? So in the case of Miss um, X, we wanted to get a sense of um, so I'm trying to vision with this here. We want to get a sense of why she was here. In her case, originally her attorney was sending her to see us because he was worried that she wasn't able to express and discuss what had happened. But she also was, um, you know, having symptoms that she discussed uh, affecting her. A big part of people coming to us is establishing, as Dr. Smith mentioned earlier, safety and trust. Um, many of our, our clients who come to us have not been to therapy before, have not been to this type of formalized service. So we want to really help them to establish trust so that they will be, and safety, so that they will be able to open up and talk with us about what has happened and how we can help them. We provide a lot of psychoeducation. Again, many of our clients have not had therapy before, not had these kind of services. So it's important for them to understand what the expectations are, what are the parameters of treatment, and what will happen during treatment. Um, we also try to look and see what their practical needs and basic necessities are. Um, do they have housing? Are they able to get to our program from where they live? Um, do they have coats? Do they have um, metro cards? I mean, what are some of the racial cultural factors that are affecting them? Where do they come from? How are they adapting and adjusting to being here in the U.S.? Um, also, what type of interventions are we going to use and why? Are we going to use group treatment, which is something that we use quite a bit of in our program? Is it going to be individual treatment? Are we going to work with the family as well? Um, what type of interventions? Are we drawing on cognitive behavioral techniques? Are we using um, psychodynamic techniques? These are all things that we try to provide information to our clients about and educate them on. Um, because what we find is that often there are a number of barriers and challenges that come into place um, that prevent people from either seeking services or following through with them. And some of these are related to the following things that I'm going to mention here. So refugee trauma in and of itself, having to flee from one place to another, um, the fear, the uncertainty, uh, the memories that get in their way. Um, simply lacking information or knowledge. Who can we go to for these for services? What is out there for us? Um, the shame and stigma. Um, many people coming to us um, have been through horribly traumatic experiences. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Miss, um, a little bit more detail about Miss X. But um, 
you know, that there is shame in talking about events that they've been through. Guilt of having left family behind um, and being able to make it safety. Fear of what will happen. Um, if I come and open up to you, will I get deported? Um, will you pass my information on to other people who might harm me? Um, a lot of isolation. Miss X and her family were residing in New York in isolation away from the community because they were not sure who they could trust. Um, what are racial cultural factors? Um, how, how do they um, get in the way? Um, what does it mean to be a minority in this new culture? Um, if I am of a different um, you know, religious group, how will the majority respond to me? There's been a lot of concern about that. Uh, language issues get in the way. If, if people are not able to communicate in English or um, uh, you know, the languages that we provide services in, how you know, how will they be able to communicate what has happened to them? And then finally, aspects around the asylum process for those who are asylum seekers. And Dr. Porterfield will speak to that later on. Um, in terms of our program, as Dr. Smith mentioned, we do work to provide integrated care. So we often start with a detailed intake, as I mentioned, that Ms. Um, X went through. Um, we also provide, have the luxury, since we are at NYU, um, to provide medical care and medical services in terms of mental health. Um, we have orientation groups, so for people first joining our program, there is an, uh, an orientation group series where they learn about what services we have to offer um, and how to get access to that. those services. We provide individual and ongoing group treatment. Um, there are psychiatric avail uh, services available, so if there are issues around medication, we can provide that to them. Um, we have a very strong social su service support department where you know, our clients can get access to metro cards to, to allow to facilitate transportation back and forth, um, assistance with housing uh, for those who don't speak English or who do speak but don't feel fluent and comfortable enough. Um, they have access to language classes and then we also provide legal support. So getting back to Ms. X more specifically and what our treatment process was like, she came um, really wanting and seeking services. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning, she wanted to feel happy. She wanted to feel, quote, normal. Um, and so we started using, you know, providing psychoeducation. Um, by the way, alongside, we we'd also started a group for, um, it had an intake orientation group for Albanians. So she was able to participate in that with an Albanian interpreter um, when she came to me. But I've omitted to mention is that, of course, I, I speak other languages, but I don't speak Albanian. So we did have to work with an interpreter that created some challenges for us. But we really started a trauma-informed approach where we established safety, established the guidelines for what we were going to be doing in therapy, um, and really drew on this model to begin to open up, um, talk about what she what had she had gone through, um, drawing on some of the um, brief recovery program by um, FOA and Riggs, um, set up this model where we provided calming, deep breathing exercises before we be began to directly address the sexual violence that she had been through. Now, as I mentioned, there are a couple of um, challenges that we face. First, we had to work through an interpreter. Um, one of the important things with working with interpreters is making sure that your interpreter is on board. Um, we actually wound up having to go through two different interpreters. Our first interpreter became a little overwhelmed and a little triggered by, uh, you know, by the process. She started having her own reactions and her own recollections. A family who had been an Albanian and had um, gone through um, difficulties, so we wound up having to bring, up, bring in another interpreter who worked with us. Um, but as we we're working, um, you know, beginning to open up, beginning to talk about some of the sexual violence that she'd experienced, um, we got a call from her attorney saying that it was time um, her asylum hearing was scheduled. So that wound up putting our treatment process on hold. Um, so just to kind of give you an a sense of the fact that we have therapy going on, um, working with her issues, but then we have the asylum process, which is taking place and taking our treatment hostage. 
So as I mentioned, the family arrived in August of 2005. She would had her initial asylum interview um, in 2006. January 2007, she had her intake with us at PSOT. But then suddenly in 2007, we were told that she had an asylum hearing. So at that point then, we had to put aside the work that we were doing on her recovery process to begin to address some of the anxiety and the fears that were coming up a lot around the asylum hearing. Um, and while we got ready for that, prepared for that, the other thing that happened was that we got to the asylum hearing and were told that it had been postponed. So as you can imagine, having worked up the courage to go in front of an asylum judge, be, potentially be cross-examined, suddenly she was told that we had to, that we weren't going to have the hearing and go back, come back in January of two, in June of 2008. So then the therapy process had to go back now to addressing the fears, the concerns, the anxiety that had come up and the disappointment that had come up from not being able to have her asylum hearing and know that she had stable status in the U.S. and go back now to addressing the other pressing concerns and issues around coping and, and memories um, before we finally had her asylum hearing in 2008 and she wound up being granted. Um, so in terms of looking at Ms. X and her family as a typical uh, family who has been through, um, had fled, has fled and had to come to the U.S., there were repeated traumatic experiences. Um, they were exposed to um, many hardships, uh, not only through the threats and the violence that she went through, but even fleeing, coming to the U.S., uh, a lot of family disruption. They had to separate from the family in Albania, come here, lead uh, isolated lives away from the family, away from the community. Um, and then the range of psychological evaluations, uh, sorry, the range of psychological reactions um, that particularly came out in Ms. X. Her husband at the time, was, as I did not mention earlier, was working under the table to try his best to support the family. So they had been through a lot of trials and tribulations, but were trying to hold themselves together. Um, <clears throat> and here they were also participating in numerous unfamiliar systems, you know, adjusting to the U.S. culture, um, dealing with language systems, now dealing with uh, legal issues, um, the asylum process. Um, all of these created additional stressors that complicated and heightened her symptoms. Um, through our work within the course of, um, you know, a year, six months, her symptoms reduced significantly and the family were able to kind of move on with their lives. Um, at this point, I think I'm running out of time a little bit, so I'm going to pass um, the baton on to Dr. Porterfield, who will kind of talk a little bit more about what comes up around the legal processes. Thank you. Um, hope uh, Looks like I'm here. And... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I'm just getting my slides ready. So thank you so much. It's wonderful to be uh, part of this webinar and want to just quickly thank APA Division 56 from all of us at Bellevue NYU Program for Survivors of Torture, um, outgoing president of Division uh, Joan Cook and the staff who've been so helpful, Veronica Allen and, of course, Charles. Um, as well as just the whole team. So just I'm going to try to be pretty brief here um, and speak about um, what Dr. Smith and Dr. Kinchalura Smith have, have laid out so well is the sort of picture of what happens to a survivor of torture who lands at our clinic. Um, and we think a lot of these principles are quite applicable actually to the work you all do, whether you're in a torture or trauma clinic or in a, uh, just a city that sees refugees. Um, and I'm going to spend about 10 minutes just speaking to you about psychologist's role in um, the legal piece that uh, relates to torture because what's wonderful about being a psychologist is that you actually have a lot of opportunities to take roles in um, dealing with torture survivors sometimes maybe not clinically but in in legal settings so just briefly um, not sure why that came up okay um, just a couple of things so there's a variety of context in which a psychologist uh, may 
need to provide some information about uh, whether someone was tortured, what happened to them, things like that. And so assessment issues. This happens with asylum, as with the case that Dr. Akinja Laura Smith just spoke about. Um, in human rights trials, in whether in uh, a tribunal, a local trial in a country who might be trying to do either uh, reparations or uh, someplace like the International Criminal Court where there might be actual prosecution. Um, in criminal cases in the United States, um, you may see a victim of a crime that rose to the level of torture um, where you testify as to the impact of that torture on an individual. Or you may at times be working with a team, um, a legal team, with a defendant who was tortured and it becomes relevant to his or her mental state uh, with the crime. Um, so some of that, for instance, is, is relevant for Guantanamo or other war on terror situations. Um, and then in civil cases where there might be damages being um, uh, requested for a person who was uh, a victim of torture. So this little chart just sort of shows that, that uh, the kind of frame of these contexts and what kinds of questions you might have to answer as a psychologist. And, and as you see, they, they're all applicable uh, to the questions. So whether it's an asylum, a, a war crimes tribunal, a criminal case, or a civil, you're going to be basically asking something uh, along the lines of what happened to this person? Who did this to this person may be relevant if it's knowable. Um, how did what happened affect the person psychologically, physically, if you're a medical uh, care provider? And then what would help the person recover? So, you know, and, um, we'll talk a little bit, I'll talk about what that means in each of these, but, but the idea is that in, in each of these forensic or legal contexts, you're basically answering some basic questions about the impact of torture. So implicit in those questions um, is, uh, are a couple things that a psychologist is well positioned to answer. One is, well, what is the credibility of this person? Are they believable? Is their story believable? Might they be malingering symptoms? Um, what does torture do to people? You know, so implicit in the question is, if you're going to say whether this person was tortured, tell us how that impacts an individual. Um, what is the biopsychosocial impact? And then a question about recovery is also often implicit. OK, this happened to this person. What, what would help them to recover? Uh, what do they need? So a court's remedy then in all these, in all these uh, contexts could be a variety of things. Now obviously for Miss X and others seeking asylum, the, the remedy is that they get asylum or some other change in their immigration status that allows them to stay where they are. That's a huge um, relief for clients, uh, obviously, to be able to get, be given safe haven. Maybe they're going to get a financial remedy if it's a civil uh, claim. Uh, perhaps there's a conviction of a perpetrator or some other uh, legal ruling might be on the table, such as this person was tortured as a, as a um, criminal defendant or, uh, or um, suspect, and they now the lawyers are seeking to suppress what they said in their confessions that were happening under torture. That's a really interesting and really important question. Um, and, and our role, again, as psychologists, very, very relevant there to be able to talk about that mental state. And then the other reason, um, that the re or the other remedy could be that just uh, the use of your assessment to work towards some system of reconciliation or amnesty um, or, or repair within a community such as you know, what was attempted in Rwanda. So a couple things. If you're assessing someone, you are not the fact finder of the outcome of the case, obviously, regarding, first of all, you're not just determining a consequence. You're not determining financial or any other consequence. You're not determining guilt or innocence of a perpetrator. That's not really your purview as a psychologist, and you're not really even making an immigration determination. What you're doing is you're assessing and opining about an individual's reaction to, uh, experience of, and consequences of torture. And so I'm, I'm emphasizing that to just say, as a psychologist, it's always helpful to be reminded to stay in our lane, um, because sometimes uh, in legal contexts, folks want to sort of drag us out of our lane and get us to answer some of the um, more essential, some, some of the more legal questions. So look, if you're assessing someone for an asylum case and you're a psychologist and you're on this webinar, you may have done it through a clinical relationship you've had, meaning you were seeing a case like, uh, seeing a person like uh, Dr. Kinchel or Smith talked about, or it could be that you are simply doing evaluations. Maybe you've um, started to do some work with Physicians for Human Rights, wonderful group, or um, some of the other uh, groups that, that provide evaluations by medical professionals. A couple just points about that is that they are two different frames, obviously. A clinical relationship and an evaluation, you know, if you look first on the part of the slide that says clinical, you know, you're going to move more slowly through material regarding someone's life as, as Dr. Akinchalora-Smith talked about. 
you know, well, Dr. Smith first talked about the, the establishment of safety, right? So that is going to first be your frame of reference of just getting the person settled, safe, and comfortable. And then, as Dr. Akinchalori Smith said, you might be doing some evidence based practice around narrative exposure or other kinds of exposure treatment or EMDR, but you might do it at a pace that is, that is very much determined. Uh, not by a manual, but by the person's real life. What's going on for them? As you heard from her case, that client had a big interruption, which was the asylum process. Now, in an evaluation, if we look on the right side, there's often one to two sessions for history taking, and that's really what you have, and the rapport is harder, and um, frankly, you need to sort of lay that out, which is, I know you may not know me, and this could be difficult. You know, it would be great if we could work together over these sessions, and you could help me understand your experience. Uh, the credibility of a client is more implicit in a clinical relationship, meaning if you've taken them as a patient and then you end up writing a report or testifying, most courts will believe that, well, that you believe them or you wouldn't be seeing them as your patient. You know, in an uh, evaluation, going to the right side, you, you need to address credibility more directly and say, I only met with them two sessions. Here is why they were credible. A written report in a clinical relationship can have, um, can, can be less like an evaluation report, and it can be, hey, this is my clinical experience of this person, my opinion about them, and how they handled therapy. That's not the way you write an evaluation report for asylum. You do instead a very straightforward review of the patient's history and their mental status and your opinions. Um, so there are two real, really different frames on reports. Um, and, and the last two points are that uh, you're going to often prepare your client for testimony if you're in a clinical relationship with them, as Dr. Kinchalura Smith did. Uh, you're not going to do that ever, really, in an evaluation. Um, and finally, you can be a source of support, and that's just wonderful, frankly, to be able to be in court, support your client, maybe testify, um, and you're not going to usually do that in evaluation. You might testify, but you're not really going to usually stay in touch with the person. So the, the thing that I want to emphasize if you're doing these evaluations, and by the way, if you haven't done them, you know, they're really a, a very gratifying process to be part of evaluating a person applying for asylum. You know, that interaction can be traumatizing for someone because it's such a review of what happened to them. It can also be healing and therapeutic. As Dr. Smith said, you know, it doesn't have to be therapy to be therapeutic. You know, a well done, careful, compassionate evaluation of a person can be experienced by them as very, very healing and we've, we've seen it a lot. And of course, truthfully, it can be both. You sometimes might be doing, um, helping someone, but it's very, very painful for them. Um, so just, I don't have time to go over how you assess torture, that's not the purview of this conversation, but the Istanbul Protocol is really the standard um, coming out of the United Nations and a team of mental health and medical professionals. It's an excellent manual, it really walks you through um, interviewing, ethical considerations, how to document, you know, it, there's reports in there, it's a, just a fantastic standard and I really recommend that you only use the Istanbul Protocol as well as obviously your clinical training, but to, to conduct asylum uh, evaluations. Just briefly, the interview considerations that are relevant are, um, you know, they're deep, right? There's many of them. So um, this will not be in depth, uh, but, I'll, but a couple points, and some of them actually were brought up by my previous two wonderful presenters. One is, what is that client's reaction to you given your ethnicity, your, your gender, where you come from, your own orientation sexually, if perhaps they have a way of knowing that in relation to theirs, and really their relationship to power. It is essential that if you are dealing with a person who's been hurt and abused, that you remember that power has meaning for them and it can have very frightening meaning. And you may be the nicest, warmest psychologist in the world, but you still represent power and authority. Interrogation dynamics are very relevant for clients who are seeking asylum and who have been held in prisons and interrogated. And what do we do as psychologists when we do our evaluations? We ask a lot of questions. So you should be expecting that those questions could be really, really challenging um, and can repeat and um, recapitulate the experience of being interrogated. I often raise that specifically and say, I know this is hard because I'm asking you a lot of questions. The client's just experience of telling their story. Have they ever done it? You should know that before you dive in. Maybe they have a million times, not a million, but many times with their attorney or with loved ones. Maybe they've never spoken of some of these things, as I think Dr. Kinchelora Smith's client had when she came into treatment. What kind of fragmentation and dissociation is present in the client? That's really important so that you can observe it uh, if you see it in the session and comment on it in the report so that you can prevent um, a court or jury or fact finder 
from thinking, hey, this person's not credible. You know, they're choppy, they don't remember things, they're not crying the way I would think they are. Those are clinical phenomena, and you need to be able to explain them to courts and fact finders and if uh, the torture survivor is to be fully understood. And finally, I just really obviously strongly recommend um, open-ended questions and not, um, not saying I'm here to evaluate whether you were tortured or not. Um, I don't ask specific questions always about techniques because that often is, I think, problematic. Uh, so I'll say, tell me about your life when you were in the prison as much as you can. You know, tell me what it was like for you. Um, you know, the questions are hard, as I say on that last comment, so I will often say, look, this is difficult, but I really want to understand what you went through. Briefly, report writing is, um, you know, it's an art, and um, if you did an evaluation, that Istanbul protocol will help you. But it means thorough, right? You want to be getting a psychosocial history of the client before they were uh, put through whatever the trauma was. Um, their experiences you want to detail. Any documentation you can provide that supports. Maybe you're lucky enough there's some records or news articles. Um, and then, of course, the, the core of us as clinicians, what are your observations of their biopsychosocial functioning in relationship to what happened to them and how they are now? If you can get medical documentation, I'm going to wrap up in a minute, um, that's obviously always an enormous support. If there's scars or burns or broken bones, anything like that. And then I usually make recommendations in any legal report I make. And I don't make the recommendation to the fact finder of what they should decide. But I will say, for instance, in an asylum report, uh, it is my recommendation this person receive treatment and not be put in a situation in which they're going to deteriorate, deteriorate or experience threat. Uh, which is an implicit description of going back to the place where this happened. You know, just on testifying, I've, I, this slide is in here and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but um, this is such a, again, such a hard, I think, and challenging part of being a psychologist when we learn to testify. I really recommend, if you're interested, that you really get trained and you read um, some of the uh, textbooks out there. Gary Melton, I believe it is, has a great textbook about uh, forensic psychology. You know, when you testify, you want to be able to talk about what was your methodology, your clinical interview as your gold standard, did you use measures, what was your record review, who did you talk to. For asylum, you want to talk about what made that subject credible to you, that person. Was it their details? Was it the way they got emotional at certain points? Was it that they were not emotional and you knew that that was consistent with their post-traumatic stress avoidance? Has the person changed over time, which would be indicative of not malingering? You want to talk about malingering if you can directly, I think. Why, how do you assess that clinically? Um, I have a method I, you know, I try to utilize that has to do with consistency and record review and lots of things that aren't always available. Uh, but you need to be ready for a malingering question in a legal context. And finally, you want to be able to talk about the, what the torture obviously was and what it did to the person and your opinion about returning to the country. So, you know, clients can be really helped by being prepared in therapy, and this is a pretty self-explanatory slide, but if you see a patient who's seeking asylum, I really recommend that, like Dr. Kinchler or Smith described, you stop and focus on what they need as they go through that. Do they need help with coping? Do they need things normalized for them, like, hey, this is a very hard process. It's okay that you're stressed. Do they need help talking to their lawyer? Um, you know, helping the lawyer know that there might be hot spots in, the, in that narrative that are very painful. So I just want to end by saying we are so essential, the, a psychologist, to the ongoing legal processes that exist all around the world in terms of torture. Why? Because torture is very damaging and it's psychologically damaging and we can really talk about, the doc, about what that has done to people, we can document, and ultimately I believe that that helps make us prevent torture by showing that there are consequences. We treat people, so obviously that's an incredibly important way to combat torture and abuse of individuals. And, you know, we know there was an ethical failure in our organization. That's not the focus of this talk. But we know that psychologists were involved in, in things they shouldn't have been. And we have a way and a, and a road towards uh, repairing that. And I just want to uh, encourage you to be part of that and, and, and let us keep, keep moving to, to make our world, uh, I'm sorry, our field uh, stronger and better as a human rights organization. Uh, I'm going to pass it now to Charles, and um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hopefully, uh, okay. No, that's the wrong <laughs> second here. Okay. So let me go. Nope, this is not where I want to start. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. 
Thanks very much. Uh, yes, yeah, speaking of, uh, of all of these things, uh, we, we appreciate very much the expertise of our panel, and I just want to make some relatively brief uh, comments and remarks, including what uh, Kate just was saying at the, at the very end there. Um, first of all, we wanted to express our appreciation to the Division uh, 56 Trauma Psychology, with special emphasis to Joan Cook, who uh, and and the previous president as well, but she really uh, stepped up and uh, led our executive committee in doing far more uh, in response to um, the Hoffman report. And of course, thanks to Jan, who's chairing this session. But uh, in terms of the presentation today, yeah, trauma exists when we recognize that there are wounds and. Um, coming out with symptoms and various things like that, that wounds populate the memories, that trauma really is a memory management issue, irrespective of the, the sources of what caused the trauma, because it ends up in our dreams, our sleep, flashbacks, thoughts, sounds. All of these things that you've heard today are very, very relevant to all traumatized people, but it's especially challenging in working with uh, torture survivors. So with healing, as noted by presenters, these torture-related trauma wounds begin to fade and are more manageable. And many of the clients, as they begin to trust their practitioners there, um, feel these kinds of positive changes. But as you all know, trust and safety, as noted by almost all of our presenters, is a critical thing. Empowerment was also noted. So making progress is especially challenging for torture survivors because they probably have experienced some of the worst experiences in one's life. And uh, not only is it traumatic, but it can change their life uh, in, in very dramatic ways. So these practitioners illustrate the importance of the prerequisites in our work with torture survivors. It's not a simple thing, but it's very needed. And unfortunately, there we have far fewer practitioners including psychologists who are knowledgeable and trained to work with, with uh, survivors of torture. And related to that, I wanted to bring up the issue of why a lot of this has started and one of the positive things about APA and the Hoffman Report. Because it's really an effort within APA to correct the problems that are cited in the independence review that was released in July of 2015. And uh, this independent report, and noting APA's role in, in enabling torture, really. Uh, and as we read the, the very, very long report, we recognized that uh, there was failures. There was institutional failures. And we are addressing that. Uh, we, as in uh, the APA, I'm a member of the uh, APA Council of Representatives, representing Division 56. So I, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to be on council and ran for election was that I knew these issues would emerge fairly soon and wanted to be part of that process and including the healing process. So we wanted to uh, look more closely at the topic of torture with special focus on how and why uh, things work and the causes and why it causes such great harm to the victims and their families and, and to the U.S. interest and reputation as a caring people worldwide and how and why it puts all of us at risk, especially those of us uh, who have been in the military and fight in wars. From my position uh, as the representative, uh, and as also Steve Gold is, is the, uh, another, the other uh, representative, uh, we both feel that APA has made great progress. Uh, there have been resolutions that are passed at Council uh, last uh, in, in the August of 2015 in Toronto that were sweeping and significant, and there were even more of them the following, uh, the following year that focus on the relationship between APA and DOD, especially military psychologists. Uh, but the changes were swift and, and effective. Uh, there have been counter reactions, of course, uh, since August of 2015, which came out in the, the midwinter uh, meeting. Um, but for the most part, uh, those were healthy discussions and that enabled the organization to move forward and to uh, be concerned about psychologists being far more informed about this not only in terms of the policy issues, but how actually to assess and treat, just like we're talking about today. But for the most part, the changes uh, remain in place, uh, that they are not wiped away or pushed away, that we not, will never go back to where we were before, uh, including but not limited to the ethics codes 
and the reviews of, of, of those that are found to be unethical. So APA leadership deserves a lot of credit, and I especially want to uh, a, sh a shout out to Susan McDaniel, who is currently the president. She's going to go out of office this, this month. And to the past president, a few presidents back, Nadine Caslow, because they are the ones that really shepherd this, shepherded this whole process of the painful um, task of looking it with reality on what was happening. And as you may know, our division responded to this report uh, first by providing a forum at the meeting in Toronto and then later in, uh, in Denver uh, for uh, discussion of this. What are the consequences? How are we feeling about that? What should we be doing about this? Not only as an organization, but specifically as uh, a division. And the sense from overwhelmingly uh, was the notion that we need to focus on the tortured and all of the torture survivors and their families. So now that we're informed, we have the moral as well as the professional responsibility for moving ahead and doing something about this. So there's been a series of informational sessions like this one, including this and previous webinars sponsored by the division in an effort to help torture survivors. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And sorry, we're running a little late. It was just, it was so hard to cram in so much information in one hour. Uh, for APA's part, from the point of view of an elected member of the council, uh, I think they've done a great job and we're still, you know, watching and observing. For example, the last council meeting in August uh, in Denver, uh, we've uh, more focused on assuring that the problems noted in the independent review were valid and real uh, by going back to uh, the Hoffman group and asking them to do some things in terms of investigations and with re increased in transparency within the council and within APA generally. Uh, and a large oversight, a larger oversight of the council uh, if, of this particular mess, but in order to avoid uh, these messes in the future. For psychology in general, both as a helping and a science-based profession, understanding why trauma does not work is critically important and that it definitely causes trauma and extraordinarily challenging and difficult trauma uh, to treat and to overcome. And that's why we're, we're so indebted to our, our, the members of this panel. And we must be prepared to work with and, and, and treating and studying torture survivors and their families and knowing how to do that the most effective way possible. So as you know, in 2015, the division began to focus on two major initiatives then as a result of this. A special issue of, of our journal that focuses on the psychology of torturers and the long-term consequences of torture and the best practices for teaching, for treatment of torture, as well as teaching uh, this, these treatment methods. The other I want to talk briefly about uh, at the end here is the Torture Trauma Initiative, Treatment Initiative, that was started by our division in collaboration with other divisions because the uh, I serve as the coordinator of this, but we have experts in this area that are from other divisions as well. Terry Keene, Ibrahim Kira, Priscilla Dash Braysville, uh, Lisa Chelo, and uh, Ani Kalyan and I uh, are part of that initiative. But what's more important really is to find throughout the world those who are leaders and should be part of an expert panel on being able to assess and treat torture survivors and to be able to, and, and the, we have an inclusion criteria that they have worked at least five years, but many, uh, most of the panelists worked far longer than that, including those who are on the panel uh, of this panel. <clears throat> so in collaboration with the panel, we hope to write three handbooks focused on torture trauma recovery that is written explicitly for these three groups. The one is for the survivors themselves in a language and in a in a platform that they can understand. Another is the, the, the torture survivors' families and how to understand that from the perspective of, of understanding secondary trauma, for example, and how best to enable their uh, survive, torture survivor family member to, uh, to, to evolve and to thrive again. And we hope to make uh, these three handbooks. Oh, and then finally, the practitioners, those who work with them. And again, we're going to be drawing on the practitioners in our expert panel to talk about that as well. But we're going to do it on multiple platforms, multiple, um, multiple languages. 
And then my hope is that we have learned, we have all learned today, and will benefit from the lessons emerging from this terrible chapter in our organization's history. I love APA, but there have been fundamental changes, uh, major, major problems that had, had emerged that needed addressing, and finally we're addressing those. And that torture victims will be made whole in the process of, of our recovering as an organization and recognizing they are the ones that have, that, that have suffered more than anyone else along with their families and supporters. So thank you very much for being part of this. And, um, and I look forward to people reading our report and uh, watching the, the DVD. Thank you. Dr. Figley and to our presenters, thank you all so much. Um, we do have a few questions here that I want to pose to you. Um, one uh, for Dr. Porterfield is a clarification question. Could you please repeat the assessments that you recommended that you use when working with refugees? Well, I actually, yeah, thank you. I didn't talk about specific standardized measures, if that was the question, and, and it's a it's a kind of a complicated issue because I think in a forensic context there's, um, there's real challenges to using some of the sort of straight post-traumatic stress disorder measures because they're very, um, they're very self-report based and, and frankly easy to, to, um, to endorse and I've seen them have some trouble in courts. So I think when I talked about assessment, I, um, I mean I could throw my slide back up if I could ever figure out how and that would just be um, a slide I think I had about, um, let me just see if I can get it. Uh, Anyway, yeah, let me pull that. Um, so so my, I was saying, you know, multi-level assessment with really strong clinical interviewing and um, using the Istanbul protocol. So let me, I'm hoping you're seeing that slide right now. Um, if you had just had show my screen, please. Got it. So uh, thorough assessment of torture is, is one of the slides. I, I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, but where I really recommend the Istanbul protocol. And... Um, that you really do a, a, a detailed psychosocial history, you get records if possible, um, and medical documentation. But it's a longer conversation, I'm afraid, to talk about um, standardized measures. Okay. If the, if the person who asked that wants to email me, I have an article I'll send them. Great, thank you. Um, for our panelists, one of our audience members wanted to know, uh, for clinicians who are working with survivors of torture, uh, what reading recommendations you might have for them. Um, is this something we would be able to email? Because I think combined together there are quite a few. I would definitely um, start with Judith Herman's The Standard. Um, but we, you know, there's a whole list that we would be happy to send out to that person um, that include publications that we ourselves have you know, been, have written. Great. And I can help follow up with that. Absolutely. Sorry, we should have had that uh, in there. We should have had a, yeah. a bibliography. Sorry about that, everybody. No problem. Um, one of the questions that we have is about uh, Dr. Akinchulare Smith. You talked about um, working with interpreters. Um, can you talk about some of the challenges there and, and maybe some of the tips or best practices that you've seen? Um, in a successful uh, clinical interaction with interpreters? Sure. Um, one of the things we have learned, because in our program we do work with a lot of interpreters, is training not only the interpreters, but also we as clinicians. You know, we don't get trained in working with interpreters in grad school. So, um, you know, meeting with little things, for example, meeting with your interpreter beforehand, finding a little bit about their experiences, because you know, if, if somebody has been through similar experiences to what the client has, you want to make sure that they are not going to start having, um, you know, compassion fatigue or secondary trauma reactions to the material that's going on. You want to clarify what kind of interpreting you want. Is it word for word? Is it, you know, summary? Um, you want to check in with your interpreter afterwards. Um, you know, what what was said, how is it affecting them, um, you want to think about seating information, uh, seating arrangement, you want to think about issues around confidentiality and safety. Um, 
talking with your patient slash client about who this person is and what role they're going to have so that they can feel comfortable and trust that person as well. So those are some things, but again, that's um, something that I'm happy to provide um, readings on. It's something I've written about and other colleagues have too. I think part of the challenge of this particular um, panel is um, Dr. Fabig was sort of alluding to is that there is so much to talk about and you know to cram into such a short period of time. So this past weekend, uh, I was with another colleague. We were at Columbia School of Social Work, and she spoke for two hours on working with interpreters. Or you know we did two hours on multicultural considerations, all these different things. So I'm hoping that today is sort of an overview. And again, if you're able to contact us or through the division, we can go into much more detail on. Um, on some of these various aspects because these these questions are right on point and I, I hate for us to gloss over them and give you a 90 second sort of sound bite over something that really takes um, much more time to get at the level that you merit and that you deserve to hear. Absolutely fair um, and and um, I'll, I'll uh, throw out one last question to Dr. Fabry here. Knowing that you've been involved in um, um, multiple um, sort of interactions uh, with APA around the independent review. Um, can you share some general hopes and wishes for our organization and maybe for our division in particular in terms of um, in terms of our next steps looking forward? Well, it's never going to happen again <laughs> because we're going to make sure that the association as well as psychologists recognize the, the horrible, terrible things happen as a result of of torture, and it does not work. And there's lots of science to show that it does not work. But I think one of the, the fundamental things was the role that the Council of Representatives play within the organization. We were getting away from reliance on and the vetting by uh, the Council. And there have been at least five different components or resolutions that were associated with strengthening that relationship and that oversight role. And I am very, very confident that uh, that will go forward and there will be, uh, it, it will be extraordinarily difficult to do the things that we've found in this, in, this independent uh, review for that to happen again. But maybe <laughs> 20 years ago people may have said that as well, but as long as I live we're not going to forget it and uh, I know I could say the same for our panelists here. We all have to be vigilant. This isn't just a, a couple of people or one division. This, this requires an entire profession to evaluate who we are uh, as, as people, not to mention as a psychologist, and that this is totally inconsistent with being a psychologist. Thank you so much. I really want to thank each of our presenters and our discussant for, again, such an information-packed um, webinar. I know we could spend a much longer time um, talking with you all. And um, I want to say a special thank you to Veronica Allen and to Joan Cook for your support of our webinar series. This will be my last presentation uh, that I'll be facilitating as I'll be rotating off. So stay tuned for next year's uh, Division 56 webinar series. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye now.